So let's focus first on photonic qubits, or as uh, we can also equivalent equivalently call them photons. So let's go back to this uh, metro area network example and just focus on the uh, repeater and the building one or node one. So in this branch um, of the network, uh, we'll be looking at kind of what's happening with quantum communication um, here, but you can also assume that each building node uh, will be similar to building one and the communications between it and the repeater will occur in a similar way. So in this graphic, you can see um, our symbol for our photon, this uh, kind of blue circle. And so in this graphic, we have two photons and um, we can imagine maybe they're traveling. One of these photons is traveling towards building one and one of these photons is traveling towards the repeater. And these um, blue lines, thin blue lines uh, between the photons uh, will be kind of indicating that the photons are entangled. So. Of course, this doesn't mean there's any sort of physical connection between them, but um, just meaning that there is some shared information or shared quantum state between the uh, two photons, where if you measure one photon, uh, the results will uh, be correlated with the measurement of the other photon. So, um, in, so again, photonic qubits will carry quantum information in quantum networks over long distances. So in entanglement-based quantum networks, they will uh, carry qubits which, which will establish entanglement, but these qubits that they carry um, don't uh, have to contain any secrets and won't contain any secret information. Um, however, in other types of quantum networks, uh, such as QKD-based quantum networks, these uh, qubits will carry, these pho photons will carry qubits which may actually encode the secret keys or information. Um, so either of these things can be true um, depending on the type of quantum network. Uh, photons can travel through free space or travel through fibers. In our uh, metro area network example, uh, our photons will be traveling through fibers because um, especially in this, a city setting, it's a little bit difficult to um, have a free space uh, quantum network you wouldn't want like a bird or a drone or something to fly in front of the photon and, and block it. It's a lot easier to just use fibers instead. So on this slide, we'll talk a bit about some of the relevant um, properties of photonic qubits that are important to look at uh, in a quantum networking context. So one of the main attributes of, of photonic qubits that's important for networking is the frequency of, of, the, uh, of the photon. So frequency is related to the photon's energy as well as the photon's wavelength. So it's related through the equation E equals HF, where H is a constant known as Planck's constant. Uh, most of us is pro have probably seen the electromagnetic spectrum and are like familiar with the idea that light can uh, that light is electromagnetic radiation and light can exist at different wavelengths and at different energies. Um, in, for quantum networking, uh, the energies we'll be working at will be the visible uh, light uh, and also the infrared um, zone of light. Some of the uh, relevant properties of the material that the photon will travel through that we should pay attention to include uh, attenuation, which is um, the loss of the material that the photon will travel through and what kind of loss this photon will experience. It's usually measured in decibels or in decibels per kilometer, uh, as well as dispersion, which is how the refractive index of the material will change with wavelength. Uh, dispersion will mean that basically light of different wavelengths will have different speeds while traveling through even the same material. So let's talk a bit about different ways of encoding photonic qubits and uh, particularly uh, rail-based encodings. So one way to encode a photonic qubit is through uh, single rail encoding, which is just an absence presence encoding. So in this encoding, we can see our, we have our two quantum states, zero and one, 
And we encode our zero state just as an absence of a photon. And we encode our one state as the presence of a photon. And then we can have any superposition of absence or presence of a photon. Another way to encode uh, photons is through dual rail en encoding. In this encoding, uh, we have two rails uh, or two fibers, two paths for the photon to travel along. And um, the state that the photon is in will depend on the rail that it's on. So if it's this example, if it's on the left rail, then this, it will be in the zero state. And if it's on the right rail, it will be in the one state. And again, it could exi exist in a superposition of these um, rails. So optic an important thing to note is that um, optical elements um, will constitute different quantum operations depending on the type of qubit encoding that you're using. So for instance, um, a beam splitter, uh, which is a, a commonly used op optical element, will uh, act as a Hadamard gate which is uh, an operator that acts on a single qubit and has a well-defined operation on a single qubit. A beam splitter acts as a Hadamard gate on a dual rail qubit, but can actually uh, entangle two single rail qubits and particularly can be used to entangle stationary qubits if stationary qubits are entangled with two single rail qubits. So uh, this is something that's important to note. Uh, there are also other ways to encode photonic qubits. Um, there is time bin encoding. This type of encoding uses a time difference between when a photon is emitted to uh, basically constitute the state that the photon is in. So if there's no delay on the photon being emitted, then it could be in the zero state, but if there is a delay, it could be in the one state. There's also frequency bin encoding. Um, this is very similar to time band encoding, but in the frequency domain. So using different frequencies to um, determine which state the photon is in. And there's also uh, polarization encoding. So polarization is a, a property of light, which will tell you the direction that the electric field is oscillating in. So again, since light is electromagnetic radiation, uh, it can be uh, visualized as uh, a wave. Um, with both an electric field oscillating and a magnetic field that's, that oscillates. And in this picture this that I have on the left, the wave is traveling along the x-axis, uh, but the electric field is oscillating in the y direction. So you could also imagine rotating this wave so that the electric field oscillates, say, in the z direction or in any, um, any vector on the uh, yz plane. Um, this would change its polarization. So people will use um, orthogonal polarizations to um, constitute different quantum states, like the zero state and the uh, one state. So let's return to our metro area network example and kind of uh, flesh out what's happening in our example. And in particular, zooming back into this connection between building one and the repeater. So at building one, we have a quantum memory, uh, which will consist of one or more stationary qubits and uh, a, a transducer as well to convert the, um, the photons that are emitted from the uh, quantum memory to a frequency which is um, well suited for the like fibers that, the, that it will go over long distances. There's also the uh, quantum repeater, which will have two quantum memories um, in this example. And uh, again, these quantum memories will have one or more stationary qubits with these transducers as well um, attached. And uh, photonic qubits are shown here, um, transmitting quantum information between the uh, quantum memories. So uh, in the next part of this talk, we'll be discussing more about stationary qubits. So kind of what they are, what's what are some ways people have implemented them, and also comparing different types of stationary qubits, um, like as research stands today. Mm -hmm.